welcome back to JW Forwardcast, the show that helps former Jehovah's Witnesses and other former members of harmful high control groups and religions rebuild their lives, take control of their destinies, and become the people they were always supposed to be. Uh, today we are bringing you uh, an interview. Um, I'm very happy to be interviewing Sarah Mills. Sarah is a writer of fiction and poetry. She's a journalist. She's an editor. She's been published in Canatus News, Huffington Post, Area Magazine, Litra Magazine, and Pathios. And she's also the blog director of Atheists America. But in addition to all of this, she's also a former Jehovah's Witness. Sarah Mills, welcome to the Forwardcast. Hi, Cover. It's great to be with you. Now, it's great to have you on the cast. Um, I, you've got a really interesting um, spread of different things you've been involved with there. You've written fiction, you've been published in various news articles. You seem to be a very busy person. <laughs> I try. I mean, I've only, I graduated about a year ago. And uh, ever since then, I've just been on the hamster wheel trying to write as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> I understand the feeling. It's, um, it's funny for, for me. I, I don't know if it's the same for you, but since I left the Jehovah's Witnesses, I've actually been far busier. But it, the nice thing is I'm okay. doing things for myself rather than things for the religion. So, Exactly, yeah. So as you're a former Jehovah's Witness, could you, before we get started, give us a quick kind of five-minute overview of how you joined the Jehovah's Witnesses and how you ended up leaving? Sure. Um, well, I was pretty much raised into it. I started going to meetings from a very early age at around five years old. And I remember the last meeting I went to, I was around 19. Um, it's funny, it's more of a a recollection of a recollection now. The experience of sitting there itself at the hall and knowing it would be my last time is very vivid, but it's um, it's hard to think that that was such a long time ago. Time is just weird when you divide your life into before and afters, but the process of leaving, a lot had been leading up to it. Um, I have a very close relationship with my family, and although I embarked on the process by myself initially. I started sharing all my doubts and, and what I was learning with my mother and talking to her about it. And it just got to that point where I couldn't go anymore. You know, I just had to be honest with myself. Mm. And, and, and did are the rest of your family still Jehovah's Witnesses or have they, have they left as well? I, I still know my parents, fortunately, um, no longer go to meetings or they're, they're not Jehovah's Witnesses anymore, but I do still have family members in the faith. Uh, okay, and, and do they still talk to you, or are you are you shunned? They no, they do. I must say, I'm very fortunate in in that regard that they do talk to me. Um, yeah, I haven't I haven't experienced shunning from them. Uh, that's... I, I don't, don't know why. Honestly, I would have expected it, but <laughs> yeah, it, it's strange because. Um... There's a, there's a, it seems to be there's a wide variation in the way that the witnesses are treated when they leave. I mean, usually if people are disfellowshipped, they're, they're completely shunned. Right. Um, and sometimes people who fade um, are completely shunned as well. But then sometimes people who fade, they're able to maintain relationships. And I am aware, obviously, on a rare occasions, there are people who are disfellowshipped, but their parents uh, or their family say, no, I'm still going to talk to you, which is rare. But it's, it's heartwarming when that does happen to see, you know, yeah, sometimes yeah. family do do value that bond more than the religious indoctrination i'm um, very fortunate but um the, the official policy is that to to not keep close relations with even family members who who are no longer jehovah's witnesses so yeah, <laughs> yeah it's it, it's a rough one it's a rough one so when you left the jehovah's witnesses now um why did you decide to study creative writing? Because that's what your, or your, your education, as you said, you've just graduated. What drew you to the study of, of writing and what, what kind of, what kind of this made you decide you wanted to be a writer? You know, my answer to that is always that it chose me. I didn't really choose it because I've always loved writing and it's always been fiction. Although I haven't published too much in that realm because I've been focusing more on um, cultural issues, political issues now and there's a lot of self-doubt that gets in the way <laughs> of fiction. But I remember in, in middle and high school, during lunch breaks, and sometimes even during class, I would just be writing down stories. And reading and writing have always helped me cope. Like I, I do it without even consciously processing what I'm doing. 
I'll be having a difficult time and I'll just start putting fictitious characters through the same or, or similar scenarios and seeing where it leads them. So, um, yeah, it's a long way of saying that I've always known I wanted to do that. That's fascinating. Actually, I've spoken to quite a few writers uh, in the last few years, and it's that seems to be a recurring theme. It's it's when I ask them, you know, when did you decide to be a writer? They're like, "Is I've always done this. I, I don't know how to not do this." It's kind of it's very interesting to see how that seems to be very similar similar with many writers. Um, you mentioned that you your kind of your first loves like fiction and poetry because I just want to ask you about that briefly because um, as we'll get onto it I kind of um, first became aware of you reading your articles on Canartis and other news and kind of current affairs sites but is, is any of your your fiction available for people to read and what's what kind of fiction do you write in your poetry? I, I have one short story published in in Literary Magazine um, so I'm very proud of that. <laughs> I do have to I have to be writing more fiction it's something that um, it's advice that all writers give you. You have to be writing every day, mm. but um, yeah, fiction is just something that I haven't been focusing on to as much as my other writing. But I do have that one short story published. Ah, cool. So everybody, we'll put some links. We'll put a link in the show notes, everyone. So go check out um, Sarah's short story, and hopefully, we'll see many more um, many more stories coming from her in the future. <laughs> so I want to just now kind of go into. Um, how you were able to sort of take your interest in writing and actually turn it into quite a wide range of media opportunities. Because as I've said, you, um, you're the editor for the Atheists America blog. You've been published in Canartis News and various other places. Um, and I think many, probably I would think a lot of people who may be leaving a high control religion and are thinking of turning to writing would be interested to see how you kind of walk that path and kind of any so that, you know, any kind of tips and tricks you have for people to sort of do the same. So what was your journey from deciding you wanted to be a writer to actually being able to develop these different opportunities with these, these media companies? Uh, well, this, this all started pretty much after my, uh, my master's program. And the focus of that was mainly on uh, the, the analysis of literary works and poetry and uh, creative experimentation, but a program like that does prepare you to tackle writing in in all its forms. So, I just found myself with a lot to say on the the, the zeitgeist, if you will. So, I went on social media. Um, my profiles have only been active for about a year and a half or so, and I I just started engaging and building up an audience with the goal of eventually starting a blog of my own. Mm. But but then I found other outlets on which to publish my work and. Um, was this oh as as for steps that I actively take you know I just I genuinely enjoy being a part of this international community of people who are brought together by a shared interest in current events and activism so I I cultivate these relationships and opportunities kind of like what we're doing right now <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so that's interesting so what basically there was a lot of getting out there onto social media and kind of getting engaged yeah. and being involved and then looking to actually cultivate relationships with people um, definitely so that's that- a big part of it yeah yeah and then and then your master's degree that gave you a kind of a a good foundation with which you could then so if I understand correctly that gave you a a good foundation that you could then use to branch out in various various directions if you wanted to oh definitely yes yes it does prepare you for just writing in general Okay. And I think that's, that's something else that's always worth highlighting, if, especially if you've left the Jehovah's Witnesses where higher education is discouraged. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, it's, it's not possible for everyone and circumstances do vary. But if you do have the opportunity, I think, to go back into education in some way or take training or a college course, it really can make a huge difference. Um, and it really does open doors that you might have thought would never be open to you. Um, Definitely. Yeah, that policy never, never sat well with me at all, that of not pursuing higher education. It does uh, shape your thinking in, in such a productive way. I would definitely encourage, I mean, depending on circumstances, of course, you can be self-educated mm-hmm. as well. You don't need to have a college degree, but um, the, the university environment is a nice one. Yeah, and that, that's actually a nice follow-up because, I mean, obviously the ideal is going actually into into a into like a structured education program. But as you've said, you can self-educate, you, you can read yeah. people. You, most people carry around a device that has all the knowledge of the world accessible through it. So guys, if, if, you, if you're looking to learn something, you can you know, dial up your phone and start researching. 
That's right. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses scare you off the internet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, really, it's such an amazing tool if you use it for the right purposes. It's just absolutely. like anything else, you know, you can use it for, for good or for bad. Yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely. So, uh, as I said, one of the, um, the basically the, the first thing I ever read from you was your article on Canatus, um, which highlighted the Jehovah's Witnesses as an example of harmful behavioral control. Could you just describe you know, how you, what that article was about and how you uh, decided to use the Jehovah's Witnesses in that article? Sure. So what motivated me to write this article was because on, on social media, um, there's a tendency, or I shouldn't restrict it only to social media, let's say in public discourse, there's a tendency to view Islam and Islamism as a very unique phenomenon. When in reality, they, they use the same tactics that are present in any high control um, organization or, or worldview. And I build upon the work of Robert Lifton, who's the psychiatrist, and he wrote in his book um, on thought reform, he outlines eight characteristics or so that would help classify a religion as a cult. Like, what's the difference between a religion and a cult? And so while Jehovah's Witnesses are not technically classified as a cult, they're a sect, I outline in this article what, what is it that makes them a cult? Because I do believe that they fit these eight characteristics. Yeah. And I, I would actually encourage people to read that article because um, one of the reasons why um, I'm highlighting it, and again, we'll put links in the show notes, is A, it's a, it's a very pertinent discussion of, of current events right now. Um, but two, it, it goes into a lot of detail as to why Jehovah's Witnesses and sort of how, how the mechanics of their indoctrination works and how they use uh, manipulation of language and manipulation of emotions and, and sort of thought limiting techniques. And I think it's important for former Jehovah's Witnesses when they leave the religion to actually analyze what was done to them, to go back and look at, you know, all of the, the thought control techniques. Because if they want to unpick all the damage that Watchtower's done to their heads, they need to understand it first. Um, and I, I think that article was, um, as you said, it, it's a very interesting comparison because a lot of people look at um, what they would class as, for example, Islamism, which I think is defined as the desire to impose um, Islamic, uh, an Islamic theocracy via politics, so actually impose it as a government, um, which, which was just kind of separate from people who just, you know, happen to believe in, in, in the religion of Islam. Have I, have I defined that correctly? Oh, yes, that's perfect. Yeah. There is a distinction to be made between um, the, the religion itself, which does have many schools of thought and allows for a lot of diverse interpretation, and then this very narrow, mm -hmm. um, comprehensive worldview that doesn't allow for any any difference, any any arguing really, any dissent. Mm. And, and in your description of that, a narrow worldview that doesn't allow any dissent, I think any former Jehovah's Witnesses would be going, oh, I recognize that. <laughs> um, and I think it's a really it's a really interesting article, so I'd encourage everyone to check that out. Um, one other question I wanted to ask you is now, obviously, you've been training in creative writing and you've been involved in writing um, articles for nonfiction and current events mag magazines and, um, and websites. Retrospectively, what's your opinion of the journalistic and writing standards that Watchtower display in kind of on their websites and in their publications? Oh, there's a standard there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... It's propaganda. And I say that with no ill will or as an attack or anything. It's just fact. Um, the tone is that of propaganda. It's insultingly simplistic and it's rife with fallacies and rhetorical questions that just sort of feed you the answers. You know, um, even the illustrations look like they're, they're out of the USSR. <laughs> uh, <laughs> The information is propaganda. You know, they they misquote scientists and they withhold information. So I wouldn't I wouldn't call it reporting. Mm. Yeah, it's it's funny because when I when I was a Jehovah's Witness, I didn't really question anything the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society wrote. And one of the things that actually woke me up was um, looking at the the infamous book uh, "Life Did It Get Here" by Evolution or Creation, mm -hmm. and I, I found out all of the misquotes, the way they'd taken the words of of um, scientists and evolutionists and other people, and literally just like chopped and changed them around so that you would come away with a completely different interpretation of what that person said. 
And it's the kind of conduct that if you were to be a, you know, if you were to be a professional journalist or if you were to write a, an article for, you know, for a, a current affairs um, website and use that kind of practice, they wouldn't touch you with a barge pole. No. Um, <laughs> and it seems to be that something Watchtower just can't help but do. It's quite astonishing. Um, one of the other think, questions I wanted to ask you, and it's continuing this theme of kind of your work, you've been quite politically engaged with a lot of your work. It's very clear reading your, um, your current affairs articles that you've kind of, you've been able to develop your own kind of moral and ethical code and you've, you know, you, you're able to engage with current affairs from a very kind of clear and thoughtful viewpoint. Now, a lot of the, um, a lot of people who leave the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, they've spent most of their life being spoon fed what they should think um, ethically, morally, and politically. I mean, politically, they're told not to think at all. And then ethically and morally, they're basically given their moral standard and said, don't think about it, you must just apply this. And then when we leave that religion, we kind of think, okay, I'm not listening to Watchtower anymore, but how do I go about building my own kind of standard of morality and ethics and politics, which you know, I think I can put faith in and I can put trust in to kind of guide me through the complex situations that real life has. So how did you go about deciding how you were going, you know, building a kind of political or a an ethical framework you thought could guide you after you left the religion? You know, I think a lot of what we consider morality um, is largely innate. You know, this could sound weird, but I don't know if if I changed so much as I simply shed something that was imposed upon me, there was a lot of discomfort growing up. You know, I never felt viscerally right. I was always uncomfortable preaching. I was uncomfortable in school because I was fighting a battle that wasn't my own. I was uncomfortable and fearful of of Armageddon and, and the Great Tribulation and God forbid, getting in an accident and being denied blood, you know, like all these things didn't seem consistent with a God who was loving. It didn't seem moral. And it was just a lot of repression of creativity, of the natural impulse to question and to learn. And so all of that was under the surface. Um, So once I said enough is enough, I felt relieved. I think like what I'm trying to say is that the framework was there. I, I knew that making fun of gay people as a lot of my witness friends did and they found it hilarious. Like I knew that that was wrong mm. and I'm not, I'm not tuning my own horn. I just, I know that religion can have, can have a huge influence on your ethical framework, but um, this was, this was just my experience. And I think, I think a lot of people just latently, they do a lot of what religions teach doesn't sit right with them, but they kind of have to silence that natural impulse to question. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that's an interesting answer, actually, because um, it seems to be not uncommon um, with people who've left. I know that one of the things I remember from my JW life was that I was supposed to be politically neutral, but I would say to people, and I, w- I would have political debates with friends, and we'd all be kind of discussing who, in it. it was funny, we'd say, well, if I wasn't a Jehovah's Witness, I would vote for this person, or I would vote for that person if I wasn't a Jehovah's Witness. And one thing I noticed is that I think everyone kind of, when you brought up that it was like a framework that had been imposed over who you Mm -hmm. naturally would have been, I think that's quite common within the Jehovah's Witnesses. And I think that subconsciously a lot of JWs know that because if you talk to them long enough, I mean, I had a friend who would... um, we were jokingly, but he was like very, very, very political, um, even though he was um, officially neutral. He would always, you could get him really angry really easily by showing him a news article on politics. <laughs> um, and it was, it was clear. I mean, it's, it's, if, if, he wasn't, if he wasn't a witness, he would have absolutely been a political activist and probably been cam- you know, campaigning for parliament. Um, and I do, I do wonder if that's quite common with witnesses. It's not so much that the, the that the Watchtower kind of created you, it's more that they were suppressing who you always should have been? I think so. I think so. There is, there's a lot of suppression of just, like I said, the natural impulse to think and to question. And even the articles and the way that talks are presented, it's all very automated and robotic and wooden. Like if you see the, the convention videos, 
Ooh, yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, the, the dramatizations, I mean, this is not how normal people talk and interact with one another. Mm. It's very wooden, you know, so <laughs> it is Sister, something that... Have you been oh. attending the ministry recently? We're worried about <laughs> your spirituality. We are in no way creepy cult people. It, that is that kind of creepy accurate. voice, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's one of the, the interesting things I've found since leaving the witnesses. And, and again, on this topic of, of um, kind of working out ethically and kind of politically what you think, I found that the most refreshing thing about it is you're allowed to debate. When you were a witness, you were never allowed to debate things. But I don't know if you found this. One of the most useful things I've found since leaving is just watching a subject get debated in an environment where people can't, you know, run away or avoid a question. Um, I kind of went through a stage of, of going through all these different, finding as many long form discussions and debates about certain issues as I could, and actually just listening to it getting thrashed out in public, which is something Watchtower mm-hmm. never does. It's not, a, it's not a conversation. You're not in dialogue with Watchtower. Watchtower is conducting a monologue and everybody else is just nodding their heads. But when you, when you engage in, in public debates, it's almost like you're, you're purging, you're detoxing, you're releasing all, this, this pent up, all these pent up things that you've been wanting to say. Yeah, absolutely. So moving on then to another question I have. Um, one question I always ask um, former Jehovah's Witnesses when we interview them and uh, former members of other religions is, or, or high control religions, or um, and we also, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping to talk to people who've maybe left um, other ex- kind of high control, maybe political groups or other, other areas that, of life that are very controlling, is what aspects of your JW training proved useful in your new life um, and how did you leverage them because sometimes someone might sort of leave a group and think well I just want to burn everything that was involved with that to the ground but when you're building your new life sometimes it's possible to look at you know some things you were taught or some life experiences that you had that now you can actually use to your own advantage it's not always the case but were there any aspects of JW life or training that you were able to use for yourself once you left the once you left the religion Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, I would say the experience itself was useful. It's not something that I would take back. Mm. I mean, fortunately, I wasn't there. I'm, I'm still relatively young, so I wasn't there my whole life. But I can say that it's an experience that I'm grateful for because it's shaped me into the person I am today. But as for the training itself, um, it was supposed to help with public speaking. <laughs> but I think I'm even more afraid of that now than I was before. <laughs> Like going out in service made me even more scared of that. (laughs) Mm. So I don't know about the training itself, but but certainly the experience altogether Mm. was useful. Yeah, it kind of like going through that, and it's quite um, it's an experience most people will will never have, and it's it kind of gives you. Do you think it might give you an insight, um, especially coming from? your perspective when you're writing current affairs articles or maybe even, you know, in your fiction and your, your, your short story and your, your poetry work, it gives you a certain insight into kind of certain characters and aspects of the human condition that might not necessarily be available to people who've had a kind of inverted commas like normal upbringing and normal life experiences. Oh, definitely. No, that, that is, um, that's for sure. Uh, that's why I say I would never take that experience back because you've, you've been on, both sides of the fence we've experienced two completely different worlds so we know what it's like we can we can empathize you know to a higher extent with um with people who are in high control religions and then we can also look at it from the outside so it is an advantage in that sense yeah and it's there's it reminds me of something um i've observed there's a there's a podcaster i follow called tim ferris and he interviews people who have um he interviews sort of highly successful artists and sports people and businessmen and politicians or or people people who've done something you know they, they've got to a very high level of achievement in whatever field of life they wanted to go to and he often asks them the question of what would you change in your 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 past you know in your history if you could and frequently he gets people saying essentially they, they don't want to change everything because they don't want to step on the butterfly. Um, that, that kind of chaos butterfly thing that I, they say, I'm scared if I go back and I alter something, I'd change who I am now. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't have the, the insights or the abilities that I have now. Um, yeah, definitely. Which, I can get behind that. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting way because uh, obviously a lot of us look back at that, that time and the temptation is to kind of, 
be bitter about time or view it as wasted. And that's understandable. And, and this is not in any way to minimize some of the harm or the damage that may come from that. And I know that some people do have horrific experiences um, growing up in the Jehovah's Witnesses. And so I'm not trying to minimize that. But I think moving forward, if we can develop a mindset where, like you say, we, we look for the look for the things we can we can bring out of that that are positive. Like as you were saying, like it's given it's given you an insight that you wouldn't otherwise have that you can really bring to bear on on your on your writing and on your work. Um, and, and I think for for XJWs generally, whilst it, it's, it's always important to acknowledge you know some some of the experiences that we had and. And not try and downplay them. It's 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 important also to try and keep a, a positive perspective moving forward and kind of take the best out of the experience, as it were. Sometimes, definitely. So uh, one other thing. This is a question related to this. Um, what was the what was the kind of the the most the hardest most limiting mindset or harmful mentality that Watchtower taught you, and how did you manage to overcome it? I would say fear. Okay. That, that is something that um, just characterizes my whole experience. There, um, initially, for example, there was a lot of hesitation to do research and it felt like tiptoeing behind someone's back. You know, like I shouldn't be doing this. So what if, what if they're right? There is a lot of self-doubt um, that comes afterwards after you dismantle this entire framework of belief and way of life. Um, I'm very wary now of the famous echo chambers. I'm actually afraid mm -hmm. of getting stuck in a way of thinking that could be erroneous uh, or partisan. Mm -hmm. And I'm also largely aware of how limited my own knowledge is. I mean, I've written things in the, in the past that I look back on now and I realize that there's a lot more I could add to them with, um, with, with newfound knowledge. There's a lot that I could re revise and improve upon. And I don't think my case is exceptional at all. You know, I don't, I suppose that happens to a lot of people, but I do believe that there's an added element once you realize that your entire worldview has been, um, has been shattered essentially. Mm. And it, it kind of goes back maybe to that previous question again, when we were talking about things, you know, useful things that you learned. And, and I tend to agree once you've been in an echo chamber, um, and for those who are curious about what that term means, it basically means if you only surround yourself with people who agree with you and with um, media that agrees with you or supports your beliefs. And again, if you're a former Jehovah's Witness, you'll be going, I recognize that. Um, <laughs> essentially, it's preventing you from seeing the other side of an argument. And this becomes dangerous because then if you're, if you, if you're mistaken in some way, you're never given the other side of the argument or an alternate perspective. Um, and yeah. so you never get a chance to test your beliefs. It's um, a handicap. It definitely stunts your growth intellectually. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I think I heard some great advice um, on the, well, because I, 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 I'm very similar. I'm very wary of echo chambers. Um, and I, I know for a fact, I mean, I have opinions on lots of things. Um, I'm fairly certain that most of my opinions are probably on the right thrust, but I'm aware that I've, I've been here before. Um, and I've been very convinced that I was right before. So I always try and I always try and find kind of a a useful and interesting opposite take on what I think when I'm online. And I think one of the uh, one of the good pieces of advice I I heard was if you're on social media, for example, if you're on Twitter, if all you do is follow accounts that agree with you, that's probably not very good a very good idea. It's a good idea to find some rational, reasonable people who disagree with you on certain things yeah. and follow them on Twitter as well. Um, because it does two things. One, it ensures that you're always having your beliefs challenged. And then you can either be reinforced that your beliefs are correct because you're seeing a challenge, but the challenge doesn't, doesn't meet the criteria of making you change your beliefs. So it gives you confidence you're on the right path. Um, or it helps you to change your beliefs if you're wrong. Um, and the third thing, and I think this is, again, comes back to Watchtower, it makes you realize that someone can disagree with you on a subject, but still be a good human being. It makes you realize that n nobody really has a monopoly on truth either. Like you can have people with different perspectives and they all can bring something very useful to the table. Yeah. And, and it's actually quite liberating to find that after you've been in, been in you know, the Watchtower religion where everyone who agrees with us is automatically brilliant and anyone who disagrees with us even slightly is basically worm food when God brings <laughs> Armageddon. Um, 
Oh, oh, it's 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 amazing because I remember being in that mindset and and just accepting it. And once you leave, and you start to realize, oh no, it's fine. People people can. I mean, there's clearly a spectrum, um, and obviously there are some extreme beliefs. Where it, would be, it would be very hard to be friends with someone who was, you know, a neo-Nazi, for example. Um, but it, because there's extremes where you wouldn't want to wouldn't want to kind of have a friendship. But you realize that there are people you can have friendships with people who disagree with you politically and who are maybe a different religion to you. Um, and one of, the, one of the great joys for me now is that I have, I mean, I'm an agnostic atheist, but I have friends who are religious. Um, I have friends who, you know, disagree with me on some political issues. But what's interesting is that the quality of that friendship isn't based on you must agree with me on everything. It's based on the content of that person's character. Exactly. And, and that's something that Watchtower doesn't allow you to do. It doesn't allow you to have a friendship based on the content of someone's character the friendship must be based on the agreement of ideology. Um, and it's so liberating not to have to do that anymore. Well said. Thank you. <laughs> so what, what I was going to ask you is, um, are there any kind of useful books, podcasts, films, or other kind of creative works that you that helped you to kind of move forward with your life or inspired you? And this doesn't just have to be in the context of being an ex-Jehovah's Witness, but generally as, you, as you're kind of like moving forward in your life, what did you find inspirational to kind of to keep you going or give you motivation? You know, it was more the sum of everything that I had read or listened to during what I call my learning binge when I was just leaving the organization. And um, that's, that's what helped me move forward. I wasn't aware right away of all the online XJW communities. That mm. was something that I came across only well after I had left. But it was just education in general that helped me realize, uh, for example, how similar different religions are and how this one was not as unique as it made itself out to be. Then uh, out, of, out of curiosity, I, just, I eventually began looking into information about the organization from outside sources and I discovered X. JW communities and um, the John Cedars channel, for example, I came across all these things later, and it was it was the sum of all these um, of all this research, let's say, that helped mm. me move forward. Yeah, it's interesting. Again, I think it's coming back to the idea that knowledge is power, um, and education mm -hmm. is is one of the most you know useful tools you can give a person. Um, That's why they don't want you to dabble in it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Um, it, there's no. There's not a coincidence that many high control groups uh, don't like their followers being widely read. There's there's a reason for that. Um, so if you if you sort of coming towards the end of the interview now, and I'm just thinking, if you had one piece of advice to give someone who's just left their former group, whatever that group might be, what what would you advise them to do? I'm very careful of dispensing advice because mm -hmm. people's experiences can widely differ. Um, people have some, suffered trauma at the hands of high control organizations. I mean, my experience was relatively benign, mm -hmm. um, but I can say that at a distance of nearly 10 years. When I reflect back on, on the experience, even without the abuse or any of the more, more horrific things that have been known to happen, um, there was still this pervasive, omnipresent fear and a disconnect from the world that does have an impact on you. So even at its most basic level, it's incredibly restrictive. Um, but I suppose if I were to say something, um, I would say to process the anger and resentment, but eventually just you have to let it go. You can't let the experience define you. Um, take advantage of modern resources to move forward, find communities of people who love you for who you are and not just as an extension of your religion, you know, re rebuild and don't, don't be afraid to seek help. Mm. I mean, that, that's really good advice. And I think that's, um, and, and that, that seeking help is something I think sometimes people feel they don't need to do or they're reluctant to do, but really you, people shouldn't underestimate like yourself, even, even with, with yourself. And I would, I would argue myself as well. My experience was relatively benign in the Jehovah's witnesses. I didn't, I didn't have happened to me. Some of the really awful things I've subsequently learned about have happened to other people, but I didn't realize how much of an impact that religion's um, kind of toxic mentality had on me 
um, until pro- I only really started realizing about a year and a half after I left that I had this bundle of dreadful mindsets and habits that were starting to trip up mm-hmm. my attempts to rebuild, um, which is one of the reasons I, um, I kind of started this podcast is because I think it's many ex-Jehovah's Witnesses and many other people from former high control groups, we actually don't at first realize how much bad wiring we have in our heads yeah, that, yeah. That, that could start to trip up our recovery. And it's important to kind of talk about it and, and find ways to get past it. I think we might even underestimate some of the impact, especially like in our cases where you were, like you said, we didn't, or we weren't even aware of some of the more horrific things that were going on. You know, we could underestimate what it does, what it does to us, but it does warp your thinking. Yeah, absolutely. At, at, the, least, at the least. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I think I remember, um, and I can't remember where I, I the, me complaining that Watchtower doesn't properly source quotes. I'm going to try and source this quote, people. So um, <laughs> check in the show notes for it. But it was it was basically that if you spend more than a if um, unless you leave a cult relatively quick. So if you join a cult and then leave a cult within about six months, you might get away with it. But if you're in for any long period of time, it just will do damage to you. Um, and there's mm-hmm. nothing you can really do about it. You, well, there's, there's things you can do to repair it, but there's no way you can walk out of a cult that you've been a part of for a long time and not be carrying some damage that you need to address uh, professionally um, or with, you know, with your own efforts. But you can't pretend that it's not there and you can't ignore it. Um, and so that I, I, I agree with you that it's, it's really important for people to kind of start to get to grips with that. And if they can, professional help is a really good way to go if that's available to you. Yeah, um, simply just talking about it as well. Yeah. With other, with other people who are in the same situation. Yeah. And as you said, like the, the, there's, there's so many resources online now, XJW communities. Um, there's, I know there's meetup groups um, that for XJWs in various places. There's having that, or even if you've got trusted friends. I mean, one thing you might find is if you're a former Jehovah's Witness, you may not be able to talk to many former Jehovah's Witnesses, but if you can build a trusted friend group who you can talk to about it. Um, you know, friends, they may not completely be able to comprehend every, every experience you've been through, but they'll certainly be there for you and they'll help you to process it as best they can. So talking to people is absolutely vital. Where can we find more of your work, Sarah? And do you have any kind of upcoming projects or things you're working on that you'd like to discuss? For now, I post all my updates on social media. So maybe you can leave those. Yeah, um, absolutely. Are you There's on Twitter? So is that Twitter, about. Facebook, and where I'm else? I'm on Twitter and Facebook, yes. Yeah. There's always something in the works. I'm always plotting behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reluctant yeah. to talk about it because then there's that um, fear that it won't come to fruition. <laughs> <laughs> no, so you've got that, you've got that, that writer's habit. You, you have to be working on something, otherwise, you, yeah. <laughs> it goes back to what it's like. Yes. I've heard, like I said, I've heard that from a lot of writers. It's like, you know, what, like I said, what, what made you decide to do this? And the answer is always like, I, I don't know how not to do this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us today on the forecast, uh, Sarah. It's been really good to have you here. And again, I'd encourage everyone to check out um, the articles I've linked to in the show notes um, to follow, follow Sarah on uh, Facebook and Twitter. Um, she gives very, when it comes to current affairs, she gives very balanced and nuanced opinions on what are some very kind of difficult and tricky uh, modern issues. So if you're looking to get out of your echo chamber or um, establish a source that you can, you can rely on, even if you don't agree with the opinions, the opinions have been reasonable and they've been well thought through and well presented, and it will help you kind of craft your own path through, through the landscape. Um, so I would strongly recommend following Sarah and um on social media and also checking out her 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 literary career which i'm sure is um i'm sure is going to go to greater and greater heights so sarah thank you ever so much for joining us thank you so much for the compliments and for having me okay so just a little bit of housekeeping to do before we draw the show to a close Um, Firstly, we've recently had those two episodes um, about apostasy, the film from Daniel Cocatilo. Um, And I just want to say thanks to everyone for the feedback they gave us on that. One interesting thing I've noticed is that the um, spoiler episode 
has almost double the amount of downloads for the non-spoiler episode. Now, the interesting thing about that is I think some people have assumed that the spoiler the spoiler version is the full director's cut, whereas the non-spoiler version is the limited theatrical release. So, you know, um, the non-spoiler version is Aliens, and then the spoiler version is Aliens director's cut, which has, you know, extra smart gun sequences and the bit where Ripley's daughter's involved and, you know, a, a little bit more cool James Cameron-y stuff. That's actually not the case, guys. They're two completely separate episodes with two completely different conversations. So it's more like uh, the non-spoiler one is Alien and the spoiler one is Aliens or the non-spoiler one is Terminator and the spoiler one is Terminator 2, you know, Um, or the non-spoiler one is Jaws and the spoiler one is Jaws 2. Oh, that's a rubbish film. Maybe that's a bad example. That's probably a bad example to use. The spoiler one is the spoiler discussion is not Jaws two. I promise. Although that's not the worst Jaws movie. Now, have you have you guys seen Jaws: The Revenge? That's I saw that as a JW because I actually watched all the Jaws films as a JW. And Jaws: The Revenge has to be one of the stupidest and worst movies ever made. Seriously. Um, did you ever hear the story? Apparently, because Michael Caine's in in Jaws: The Revenge. Michael Caine, British actor. Um, and there's a really funny um, interview with him um, where he was asked about why he did Jaws, t- Jaws the Revenge because it's such a dreadful film. And apparently um, he was reading the script and the script begins, fade in the Bahamas. And he was like, I'll do it. <laughs> and the other thing I've heard him interviewed about this film, and he apparently he says something like... Um, I've never seen Jaws of Revenge, but I've heard it's bloody awful. But I have seen the house that it bought, and it's very nice. So, yeah. (laughs) Good on you, Michael Caine. Anyway, getting back to the housekeeping. I have some thank yous to um, put out on air to some very kind uh, new patrons who've sponsored the Forwardcast at the $1 level or above. So, huge thank you to Becky, Daisy, Mark, Peter, and Lloyd. Thank you very much, guys. That's really sweet of you. Um, and if you'd like to sponsor the Forward Cast, you can do that at um, Patreon slash Covert Fade. Um, you get lots of cool extras uh, and uh, cool rewards in, in return for your support, including things like the ability to vote on the topics of upcoming Forwardcast episodes. Uh, you get some extra bonus content the, that's on there for patrons only. Uh, you get early access to Forwardcasts, and you're also going to get access to things like um, Ask Me Anything. So I'm going to do an Ask Me Anything every month where you guys can just ask me questions and I'll upload an audio episode answering those questions that's just for patrons only. So thanks ever so much for that. If you'd like to send in questions for the Forwardcast for myself and uh, Alice Cheshire to discuss on air, you can do so at jwforwardcast at gmail.com. That is jwforwardcast at gmail.com. Send in your questions um, and we will answer them. And also in the notes, if you can tell it, if you can tell me if you'd like your real name used or not, because obviously I'm aware that some people are in sensitive situations and they don't necessarily want their real name used uh, online. So... Um, when you send us a question, just include that as well. I'll probably email you back and check as well. And to be honest, if I email you back and you don't reply, I'll assume I can't use your name. So, yeah, either way, it'll work out. So, yeah, thanks for listening, guys. Um, again, if you'd like to support the Forwardcast, um, you can do so by subscribing to us. We're on iTunes, uh, Podbean. Uh, I've tried to get onto Google Play, but apparently you need to be in the US to do that at the moment. So I'm trying to work out how to navigate that particular hurdle. Um, we're on a couple of other places as well you can find us on YouTube you can subscribe Um, so you can also leave us a review and a rating um, or give us a like if you're on iTunes uh, or iTunes no YouTube give us a like if you're on YouTube and a star rating if you're on iTunes and a a, a general hug if you're on any other podcasting uh, podcasting app that you use um Additional ways you can support us, you can tweet about us, you can support us on social media, uh, you can share the podcast with your family and friends, um, although obviously if your family and friends are JWs, that might get tricky for you, so maybe, maybe don't do that. So in conclusion, thank you for listening, and remember, you only get one life, so work out how you want to live it, make a plan, put that plan into action, and start living your life now. <laughs>